Hey, so glad you've all joined us today. Welcome. Uh, good to have you two up here with me. Thank you. I was listening to a couple of people talk after the service like, man, that pastor does. He has a lot of wisdom when he talks. <laughs> Whoever you are, I appreciate you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh. So uh, as we are working through making disciples and leading with purpose, I think I'm going to rearrange the intro yeah. on everybody. And where I ended last service, I wanted to start this one because I was just meditating on it all through the last service. And when we look at what the Bible teaches us we're supposed to do as his people or as Christ followers, the church, the body of Christ, okay, uh, I see very clearly that Jesus was very instructional with his disciples. There was relationship, but he also gave them a lot of it. Come and follow me. Just drop what you're doing and come follow me. He didn't really, uh, you know, waste a lot of time with people that were looking um, in the wrong direction. In, in fact, at one point in his ministry, I saw there was hundreds of people and they all left because they didn't like the message that Jesus was delivering. What's that? Yeah, it was too hard for them. They didn't want to do it. And, and I feel like there's a little bit of a warning for us in the church world today because I, I've heard this phrase, and, and again, I ended with this, but I've heard them people say that the church is a hospital. And I'm like, well, I like to think the church is a mobilization center, the local assembly of believers, where we send people out, where we activate, we equip. There's a, there's a healing wing for people that need some healing and some restoration and, and some, some time to just kind of soak in the presence of Jesus. But if the only thing we are is a hospital, it becomes a very narcissistic church because then we lose the mission to go into all the world and take the gospel to every creature, to every person. So when we're talking to you today about leading with purpose... I think we have to have this framework and this understanding that God has really assigned his church a mission or an assignment, which we're going to talk about today. And that assignment, it falls to you as well. All of us have a place. All of us have an assignment on our lives from the creator. And it's not just about coming to receive. It's, it's a reciprocal where we come and we serve others. And as we serve others, we also start receiving back as well. That said, um, foundationally for today's lesson, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background as pastor okay. is, Thanks. and um, leadership into the workplace? Um, just before I, I, I start, if we could just uh, open in prayer, I'd, uh, I'd appreciate it. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day and for your many blessings. We thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to steward your word together, to chew on it, to be edified, Lord, to learn from one another and from you. We thank you, Father, that everyone here, you had foreknowledge that they would be here and that you have something planned for them to receive. Show them what it is, Lord. Help us to extract what we need to so that we can grow, so that we can mature and become more and more like Christ. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So as Pastor said, my name is Des Griffiths. Um, I've had just a little bit about my background. I served as an executive leader in the marketplace for, for 30 years, 15 of those years as a CEO of a multinational organization. And uh, I felt called to the marketplace at the age of 26. I was like, I'm called to the marketplace, but I'm also called to ministry at the same time. And I felt like, I had to choose between the two. You know, at that time, I remember thinking about ministry, thinking, I don't think I want to be around Christians all the time. You know, nothing wrong with Christians. <laughs> but I, I felt like I was called to, I, I guess the phrase that God gave me at the time was, where rubber meets the road Christianity, where faith and life intersect. That's where I wanted to be. And so, so feeling the calling to ministry in the marketplace, I guess I, I chose the marketplace, but over my career, 
uh, God showed me that the approach that he gave me to leadership in the marketplace was really from his perspective. And uh, upon my retirement, I retired in 2021, I realized that I had been pastoring all along, just in the marketplace. You know, so, so I, there really isn't a choice I have to make. You are who you are everywhere that you are. You know, and that's what I found uh, with how he taught me to lead and steward the leadership gift, all of the principles he has there in the Bible. Now I believe he's given me this mandate and I feel this passion on the inside and I can sit and talk for hours about this. I have a, a fantastic group around me that, that helps to facilitate those conversations, but I feel like we're here to guide the body of Christ in his plan for leadership or discipleship in the workplace. Now, depending on the context, you've heard words like discipleship, you've heard leadership, You've probably heard coaching, you've heard mentoring. It all talks about the same thing depending on the context of where it's happening. You know, but since we're, for me, we're talking about mar marketplace, we use the term leadership. And um, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to say, I mean, we started the leadership in the workplace ministry, you know, with, with this in mind. How can we get the body of Christ to see the opportunity to lead in the workplace? And it's an eight-week or, sorry, a seven-week course uh, it runs three times a year. We're on the uh, fall session right now. We'll start again, I think, sometime around March or April. And um, Kelly Penner and uh, Jonathan Nahimana help to administer the program. They're sort of the administrative leads. But I have a wonderful team um, around me of business leaders and executives and, you know, frontline people in the workplace that help to facilitate that content. And I'm so blessed and privileged to have them. You, how many have taken leadership in the workplace? Okay, and many more I'm sure will as we move forward because this graphic I wanna walk you through is really what the church is about. If we can, if we can throw the graphic up for a moment. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. <laughs> is it there? Okay, good. So this graphic is called the Congregant Path. And, and as a church, as an equipping house, you can see we start at services, but you have encounters and all things WCF as opportunities to get to know about the church and to, and to, to get deeper in your relationship with God. Then you can see D2LO there, which is discipleship orientation. Many of you have taken that. Then you have the opportunity to connect and serve you get into Pathway to Maturity. Pathway to Maturity are those classes that, that we have that help you to get deeper in your understanding of the Lord on a particular subject or area. You know, or if there's an area that you're struggling with, there's an opportunity to take a class on that. But then you see leadership in the workplace as a stop on this track. Because I'm a track guy, it's a track. <laughs> so leadership in the workplace is that large area of discipleship as it relates to the workplace. And then leadership equipping days, four times a year we have that. And as you can see, the track continues, the opportunity to continue to get developed and equipped and so on. So leadership in the workplace is, is a stop uh, in the discipleship process here at WCL. Amen. So today we're talking about, again, um, it's a discipleship series. And today's message is really about leading. And my name is Kim. Hi. <laughs> you don't know who I am? <laughs> How many, how many know who she is? Me? Seen hardly anybody. <laughs> yes, like, let's hear about Kim this service. There it is. My name is Kim, and I'm married to this guy, and I serve this guy. Um, <laughs> and She's really humble. <laughs> I'm on staff here, um, and I support Pastor RJ and Mary in, um, in the creative areas, the ministry. So, um, And then, of course, I support this guy. Um, in our home, and we've been married 33 years, and we have three kids, and uh, three adults now. Three adult girls, three um, uh, <laughs> son-in-laws, and one uh, grandbaby. Uh, Shout Nathan. out to Ezekiel if you're Ezekiel watching. Isaiah. Okay, so today we're talking about. Before I was interrupted, we are talking about leading with purpose. And uh, it's part of the discipleship series. And when you talk about leadership and you talk about purpose, and we're going to define those two, what is leadership and what is purpose? So first of all, let's take a look at purpose. And we think about 
you have a purpose, I have a purpose, Pastor RJ has a purpose, Desmond has a purpose, we all have a purpose. Um, but is our purpose the same or is our purpose different? So do you want to define purpose? I can. Sure. Sure. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. I kind of see in that verse where God wants to dwell among his people and live with them and we can be his people. And, and that speaks to our purpose of the church right from the scriptures, which is redeeming our communities, our partnering with God to redeem people back to himself. And the whole purpose that God had when he came to planet Earth was a plan of redemption to restore humans into relationship with the Father. And, and as a result of that, we, his people now, we work with him to bring others, sons and daughters who are maybe not in relationship with him, back into relationship with him. Because God created all of us, but some people are not in relationship with him and they need to be. So for us, we want to go out into the community and, and partner with God to bring people back into the community. That would be, that would be a, a purpose or a vision statement that we can make. You want to expand on that, sir? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> you know, when we think about purpose, you know, you hear, you hear people say, what's my purpose? You know, it's, it's your reason for being. It, it's what gives meaning to your life. And somehow it's connected to your identity, just understanding who you are and why you're here. You know, if you, if you spend some time talking to some high school students that are, are ready to graduate and you ask them about career choices, just the way they're contemplating and struggling, you understand that somehow they're trying to figure out what their purpose is. You know, what is it that I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life? What is it? I don't want to make a mistake. You know, and so you can see that for them, somehow this career choice is tied to their purpose. And people, when they may, maybe lose a job after serving for a long time, 12, 15 years, you know, that job has become a part of who they are. And you can see when, when that job is no longer there, it, it's like they're lost. There's part of their identity that's missing. Somehow they're, they're without purpose or feel a sense of loss related to purpose. Or maybe they've retired, you know, after serving somewhere for a long time. And that really was a source of their identity, you know, how they looked at themselves, how they sort of defined their purpose and their role in life. Or if you're a stay-at-home mom like I was and you raised your children for X amount of years and then they grow up and they leave and you're like, what the heck's going on? Now what do I do with my life? If you're... if if you're wrapped up so much in your children and you think that raising them is your, in, in, is your purpose, and I went through this, you feel lost when they're gone, now that they've gone to start their own lives. Mm -hmm, for sure. But, you know, you, all of this conversation seems to point to somehow this thing that I'm going to do is my purpose. You know, but the Bible is very clear, really. God has a purpose. Pastor just talked about it. Church leadership here has a purpose. And we, the body of Christ, we have a purpose. And somehow they're all connected. You know, when, when you talk about the purpose that, that God has, we've made that part of our vision statement, haven't we? Redeeming a people from all peoples. Redeeming our community. That's what God is about. We sang about it this morning. He's about redemption, 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 trying to get people back into relationship with him. So that's his purpose. And we spent a lot of time here at church talking about, you know, what it is that the staff does, the leadership of the house, right? You know, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, we spent some time reading that in past conversations. Now these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So you see the leadership of the house has a purpose, and that purpose is to equip. But this work that they're talking about, what is this work? What's this work that we've been given as the body of Christ? And that's all of us here. You know, the 2 Corinthians 
5, 18 to 20 talks about one aspect of it. It looks like this work has something to do with reconciling, but let's read. You know, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So we can see that this ministry of reconciliation is something we've been given as a body of Christ. And, and from that, we extract one aspect of the identity related to this ministry, and that is the identity of ambassador. But pastor, there's, there's another aspect to the identity when it comes to this ministry of reconciliation that, that the Bible talks about. There is. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies, the wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we're get, let's go back to our purpose again, is to equip, to be equipped, right? Because um, that's the process of being a disciple, right? You're being equipped and you're equipping. So our purpose is to be equipped and our leadership does that really well. Then our other purpose is to reconcile, right? Be an agent where the Holy Spirit can work through us to bring people into the knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is. And we can do that without even speaking, just by the way we conduct our lives, right? And um, the other aspect of purpose is ruling. God didn't put us here on the earth just to get by. He put us here to make a difference. So there's a, there's a, pro, there's a purpose that we all have, and that is to rule and reign in our sphere of influence. Does that make sense? Okay, so pastor, in that scripture, you read, you know, that we're called to be priests. And when I think of being a priest, I think about Old Testament and the role. But I can't put myself in that role. I just, like, it's, it says right here, we're called to be priests. But then I think of priests, I think about some religious um, communities that actually have priests. We don't have priests here. Jesus is our high priest. So why don't you unpack what that looks like for us if God is calling us to be priests? What does that look like? See, now that I've had time to think about it, I've got a whole lesson ready for you. I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> From first service. Uh, it's, it's important to notice, I think, in the old covenant, you had the office of the king, the office of the priest, and the office of the prophet. And they all kind of administrated a little bit differently, but they worked together to point the people to the theocracy that they were under at that time, which would have been a nation under God. In the New Covenant today, we have different political arrangements in our world all over the place, but ultimately we want to serve who? The risen King, Jesus. So if Jesus is the King now, and he also is our high priest, and he also is a prophet, because you see the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus in the book of Revelations. But see, the priest was the one who mediated the terms of the covenant. So in the Old Testament, they were the ones that offered the sacrifices on behalf of the people. They stood in the gap on behalf of the people, so they approached God on behalf of the people. And there's a, there's a priesthood of all believers today where we have a responsibility to go to war for our brothers and sisters. We have a responsibility to go stand in the gap, to reach out, to mediate, to intercede, to pray for, to bless other people. And I'm going to throw it over to you guys to pick up from that. You know, when we, we look at those two identities... The one of ambassador, I, I mean, I get, you know, you, we're, the ambassador represents the values, represents the, uh, the nature, the character, the interests of the kingdom that they're coming from in the kingdom or to the kingdom they're living in. So this ambassador is going to represent the nature and character of Christ, you know, the fruit of the spirit manifested in your life, making the invisible kingdom visible. I can see that ambassador nature. But when it comes to priest, you know, I have to confess, you know, in my relationship, I grasp the ambassador piece, but the priest part, the pastor just talked about, I didn't hold on to. I didn't see the responsibility that I had to mediate, to intercede, to stand in the gap. 
of those that were lost, those that maybe I was working alongside. You know, I can think of, you know, I guess people that are saved, my friends that are, are walking with me that I would intercede for, the needs that they have. But my prayers, I got to tell you, were pretty selfish, even as a believer. We know the world is selfish, but how many know selfishness can make its way into the church? Never. <laughs> you know, and, and I can think of my walk being, you know, God protect me, God grant me favor, God meet my needs. You know, I want to provide for my family. I want to make sure those needs are met. And it's about protection. When I think of some of the people I don't like or some of the people that give me problems or some of the difficult relationships I have, it's God protect me from those things. Quench those fiery darts. Help me to navigate this landscape. But never did I think of them as the sons and daughters of God that I should intercede for, stand in the gap for, bring petition for, ask for his grace and mercy to be extended, ask for, for him to open their eyes so that they may be freed from some of these things that are binding them. I'm looking at it as things I, I, need, I need to be protected from. I'm certainly not availing myself to mediate and stand in the gap on behalf of them. But that's what this is talking about. It says we're the temple. We carry the presence of the living God but we are priests, holy priests. And so we have this, this, this mandate to, pr to pray and mediate, to, to, to have service, to, to offer such special sacrifices of you know, acts of service and kindness, inviting others into this restored relationship. And you know, I, that changed throughout my career when I started seeing that, but, but it took a while to get hold of this idea of priest. Anybody relate to that? Just me? Thank you. <laughs> if you remember, you know, we're, we're talking about reconciling people back to Christ and back to God. And that reconciliation process is what God has called us to be a part of. So ultimately, we have to join him in that work. And therefore, we have to have the heart of our father. If God put breath in my lungs, and we sing about it in worship, you know, it's your breath in my lungs and I pour out my praise to you. It's your breath in my lungs. Well, if it's his breath in my lungs, that means it's his breath in everybody's lungs. If you're breathing, it's because God gave you breath. So if I'm looking at someone who doesn't know the Lord and is giving me a hard time at work, not here, maybe when I work Never. somewhere else because everybody's great here. <laughs> Especially me. But if God has put breath in their lungs, that means he's also given them the purpose to live for him for eternity. And we have to see that. Every person you come in contact with, even as difficult as they may be, they have God's breath in their lungs. So ultimately, God has a purpose for them. And I have to be about joining him in mission and seeing people as my purpose, as opposed to just the job that I'm doing. And we'll get into that a little bit later. I just want to piggyback on this. That's why it's so important that we become mature believers. You know, it's so important that we mature in Christ. And the emphasis that the Bible puts on that, because if you're not mature, you're not thinking about other people. You're thinking about yourself. You're so far from seeking God for what he has for other people. You're so concerned about having your own needs met. You know, but the, the piece I want you to get from this conversation on purpose is this ministry of reconciliation that we've been given is our purpose, as Kim is saying, and not the thing we do. You take your purpose with you into all of the spheres of influence that you go into. Your purpose is this posture of your heart, who you are becoming, and joining him in this ministry of reconciliation is what you're all about. Now, your assignments may change. You may go to different places, different venues. Kim had talked about being a coach, being, you know, a mother, you know, being an employee. The venues may change, but your purpose is going to remain the same. You know, your influence may be different than mine, but we have the very same purpose. Amen? And here's the, here's the heart indicator that we need to look within to see. And, and right now, it's a, it's a defining moment for your own life because 
there's, there's two pathways that you can take. There's the narcissistic, egocentric, self-centered pathway, or there's the pathway of the servant, the pathway of love, the pathway of peace that Christ was the example for us in. And it comes down to, is there a core conviction in your heart to accomplish the assignment, the purpose of God on your life? And are you partnering with him for that? Or are you only in this for what you can get out of it? Okay. And that's the, that's the conviction piece that I find the North American church and some of the other Western philosophy churches really struggle with that conviction piece about love for the lost, love for souls, passion for those that don't know Christ. That said, Kim, if you were to define leadership in a biblical context in light of this leading with purpose, what would you, how would you describe that to us? I would say in a biblical context, your leadership is one that brings honor to God. Um, the way you conduct yourself is bringing honor to God. You're leading in a way that when people encounter you, they encounter Christ, first and foremost. And so your leadership should be leading them to something, not away from something. Your leadership is where you have influence. And influence meaning where you have impact, where you have the most impact. So if you're going to school and you're there full time, that's where you're leading. That is your sphere of influence. If you're a mom and you have children at home, that is your sphere of influence is along with the father. If you're working outside of the church or whatever, that's your sphere of influence. That's where you have impact. That is where God is calling you to lead. That is where God is calling you to reconcile people back to him. So in light of Matthew 5, talk about influence for me. Going to read Matthew 5? Or? I can read it for you, yeah. sure. Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. What good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Well, that's good. I love the context of that scripture because I see influence all over that scripture. You know, and, and we've defined leadership up here, but I'll be more explicit. Leadership is effectively stewarding your influence. We all have influence. If you say, how many, how many believe you're a leader? How many of you believe you're not? A few brave souls. <laughs> If you don't believe you're a leader, it's because you haven't really stopped to take a look at the impact that you have on the people around you. You are influencing all the time, whether you choose to recognize it or not. But are you careless about the influence that you have, or are you intentional about stewarding the influence that you have? You know, we bought into the lie in this generation, in this time in the world, that you know, if you're not charismatic enough, then, and if you're not commanding um, with your presence enough, or if you're not extroverted enough, well, then you're not a leader. If you don't have a formal leadership title or leadership role, you don't have a badge that says boss, then you're not a leader. But the reality is, we're all leaders. We are stewarding influence, or we're influencing all the time, but we can steward that influence the only thing that changes with leadership is how we lead. When you look at your personality style, that may dictate a very different approach than mine. Some of you may be out in front saying, follow me. Others may be in behind going, let's weigh the pros and cons of this. Let's get buy-in, and then let's move together in unity. However you do it, based on your personality style and approach, let's not kid ourselves. We're leading. We're influencing all the time. And in our marriage, you know, you guys might get a kick out of this. When I was, when in early years, they, I would hear the, 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 head, the husband is the head of the house. You guys heard that before? 
Never? And then you would hear, the wife is the neck. <laughs> that controls the head. <laughs> is she influencing as the neck? Absolutely. The point is, we influence one another, and we lead, and we do it differently. So you are leading, you're leading all the time. And the scripture that Pastor read, you know, talks about how you lead and who or what we're leading people to. Is it for your selfish benefit and gain, or is it for him? Do you make much of Christ or much of yourself? Do your actions show God in a good light or in a poor light? Do your actions lead people to God or away from him? Are you salt? Are you light in the way you influence people? Amen? I mean, like we said, you can impact people whether you you think you are impacting them or not because you don't have to say anything. People are always watching you. They're always, and you look at little kids, they, and they, oh my gosh, why are they doing that? And you realize they've been watching you. They can't even speak yet, but they're already doing things that you're doing, right? So people are watching you, so you have an impact. You're a leader simply because God has put his fingerprint on you and has given you your, his Holy Spirit, and he's causing you and wanting you to bring people into a relationship with him, and so therefore you're leading. We're, we're all in that boat. So the next conversation we want to talk a little bit about is um, job versus assignment. Many of us think that, the, like we talked earlier about, is um, the job is who we are. The job is what we are. But Desmond said that that's not it. Basically, your job, if all of our purpose is the same, to equip to reconcile, to rule, to be ambassador, to be a priest, we all have that, regardless of whether I'm a plumber, a lawyer, a doctor, a preacher, doesn't matter. We all have the same purpose. So then what is our job? Our job is our assignment. And it doesn't matter um, if you change jobs, your assignment is always the same. Amen? Does that make sense? I think this might be a good place. Can we play the video work as worship, please? Work. Most of us spend over half our lives at work. Whatever it is you fill the nine to five with, planting crops, building cars, taking care of patients, teaching students, or running a business, work is where most of life happens. For some, work is a drain. They dread Monday mornings forcing themselves to struggle through because they need the paycheck, while many times feeling trapped and beaten down by their job. Some people love their work. They're good at what they do. It energizes them. It's a place of security, a place to chase dreams, desires, and success. At work, they find fulfillment. We often forget to connect our faith to our work. We don't consider the reasons God may have us at our job. We don't think about the purpose and meaning we could bring to our work. We simply focus on how it makes us feel. But what if we saw our work as an opportunity to worship? As Christians, we are called to serve Christ with our lives. For a few, that means working as a pastor, a youth minister, or a missionary. Others serve the church by teaching children or singing in the choir. But when Sunday is over, most of us return to our jobs outside the church. For us, our mission is in the marketplace. We may not be the kind of missionary who moves to the far regions of Africa, but around the conference table, around the water cooler, around the cubicle, we have an opportunity to worship the God who created us. He gave us skill. He gave us passion. He gave us work. When we do our jobs with excellence and integrity and diligence, it's an act of worship. We are displaying God's craftsmanship to the non-believing world around us. We are earning the right to be heard. We don't see a divide between Sunday and Monday, between the sacred and the secular. We've been invited into parts of the world that a pastor or a traditional missionary will never see. We have conversations with people who would never set foot in a church. Whether we love or dread our work, we choose to turn the focus away from ourselves and toward the mission God has for us. Church is not the only place we worship, and Sundays are not the only days on our calendars that have meaning. Every day on Mission for God brings us great joy. Like the heroes before us, we can be modern day Noahs and Josephs and Peters who are called with a purpose. God has designed us. He created us to work and to worship. For us, 
Work is worship. Okay, I'm just going to reread uh, the scripture from this morning. It's Galatians 3, to 24. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them, with, since, serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear for the Lord, working um, willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as, you, as your reward and that the master um, you are serving is Christ. Thanks, Kim. So when you, when you listen to what Kim just read and you look at, at the video that we just watched, you see this layering. You see, you see that there's this duality that exists. We are serving an earthly master. We're doing a physical task, a physical job. But we have a purpose that's layered on top of it that is for our real employer. So we're serving our real employer while fulfilling the duties that are in front of us as we serve our earthly master. Can you see that? So as Kim is talking about it, the idea is that your assignment is the deeper purpose God has for you behind what you're doing. It's not just about making widgets. It's about the people that are there as you do it. God is more concerned about people than he is about things. And the wonderful thing about it is if you make people your priority, God makes the things happen. I've seen it play out. I've seen it play out in my life. I've seen it play out in the workplace. It's part of that seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is that? What is, what is the kingdom of God except making the invisible kingdom visible to these people that need redemption? When you do that, this, all these other things, he says, will be added to you. Remember that scripture? So, so the, the important thing here, as you kind of look at it, and this is where I want to segue, is we need to discern what the will of God is for the assignment that he's given us. You know it's not just about making widgets, so what is it? Why is Dale in my life? Why is Susie in my life? What's going on in Susie's life? Show me what I need to see and know. What is it you're trying to get across to her? How can I be a priest? How can I be an ambassador in Susie's life or in Dale's life? You know, God doesn't look at work the way we look at work. We've made work this thing, this I got to get the money, I got to get my paycheck so I can pay my tithes. I've got to take care of the needs of my family. But he has much more, a much bigger picture and vision for work than that. It's really about the people that are there. And if you look at, you know, how many people have looked at work as part of the curse? It's hard, man. You just survive in the week. You're just trying to get by. I can't believe it. I made it through another week. Well, well, work was part of God's original design. Did you know that? Did you know that God worked? God worked, and at the end of each day, he said, that's pretty good. So God did good work. And when he made us, he said, that's very good. (laughs) So he did even better work. And he gave us an assignment, a job to do. So God is about work. Now, the curse made the experience of work more difficult. But in its original design, it's from him. And so that scripture in Colossians is talking to slaves. And it's telling slaves the attitude that they should have when they work. Can you think of a more difficult hard situation than slavery? So he's talking to the worst of the circumstances, and he's saying this is the attitude that you should have as you work. So he's saying there's something much bigger that's going on here that he is doing through how you work, which is important for us to know. And so this this segues to this idea about excellence as it relates to work fasting. I was actually just going to go into that. (laughs) Um, when we look at how the kingdom of God works versus the kingdom of this world, there's some stark, distinct differences in the way that they operate. And in Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then it talks about you'll learn God's will. And in my life, I found long before I came into ministry that being the best 
I could be at whatever my task assigned to me was um, gave me more of a platform to share faith with others. When I worked as a gas station attendant, it was the perfect job to just love people and serve people. And whether it was um, the Hell's Angel guy that came in with his bike and he actually trusted me not to spill gas on his bike because I knew how to do it properly because, you know, you don't want to spill gas on their paint, okay? Or whether it was the doctor who uh, was coming in on his way to the night shift or the lawyer or the, the line worker um, or just the person that was really struggling in life. You know, it was a great opportunity to love people. But my point is... Loving people, I got that platform because I was excellent at doing what I did. We had the cleanest gas station around, clean bathrooms, clean islands, clean the pumps. Everything was polished. The store was mopped. Everything was organized. You know, same at the bank. When I worked at the bank, I memorized a, a, about a 140-page manual. And my manager used to call me all the time and say, hey, I can't be bothered to look this up, but I know you know it. There's something said to being excellent or doing going a little bit further than everyone else and then it gives you a platform to speak into things and to speak into people's lives and it gives you the ability that when you love people they also know that you're authentic because they're not carrying you you're carrying them oh it's really good you know and, and the when i when i think about the marketplace the marketplace has a currency that gets you respect you know, and that's what good work does. You need to hone your skills. You need to be good at what you do. Because excellence is the currency that gives you a platform to speak into people's lives. Christians in the workplace often miss this. And they'll go around talking about their faith, completely discrediting or not giving their attention to the role that they have to fulfill while they're there. You need to be excellent at what you do. When you are excellent at what you do, people want to hang around with you. They want to understand how you got that good. They want to hear from you. And we know this is true, and Kim's talked about it at home, where you have certain celebrities. You know, you'll have somebody that might be a really, really good basketball player, really good at what he does, and all of a sudden he has a platform to speak on all these other issues <laughs> that he may have zero credibility on. But people listen. Why? Because excellence is a currency that gives you a platform to speak into people's lives. So be excellent at what you do in the workplace. But the other thing is, working with excellence and diligence is a way to honor God. Your performance at work should reflect your desire to glorify God in everything that you do. And when you do your best work, that's when you show up reliably, you give your best effort. You know, regardless of your, your leadership position, it, it shows respect for the opportunities that God has given you. And finally, finally, the point I wanted to make is generosity. You know, be generous with your time, be generous with your talent, and be generous with your resources in the workplace. The world will tell you to keep those things to yourself because it means job security. But the person's name on your paycheck is not your employer. Who's your employer? Be generous. You have no idea what that does to people when you share your talent, share your time, and share your resources. Even when you think they don't deserve it. Especially when they don't deserve it. We read that scripture in Colossians. You have no idea what it does to somebody when you are good to them. And you hold yourself to that higher standard that you're called to, even when they don't see that they deserve it. God is doing something bigger than making widgets. He's in the business of transforming lives. And if we will mature and get ourselves out of the way, we can see what he's doing in the lives of people. So it's very important that we're generous with these things because there was a time when you didn't deserve it. And yet Christ went to the cross. And yet he went to the cross for you. You guys are talking about um, people are our purpose. We talk about people are important. People are valuable on your job. But what about the fact that the jobs need to get done? And so I've heard the phrase, you know, it's not personal. I mean, it's just business, right? Um, things need to get done. So is it personal or is it just business? 
It's all personal. <laughs> it's, not, it's not just business. People say that uh, as an excuse to, to exhibit bad behavior. Of course it's personal. How we treat people is personal. The relationships we have with people is personal. You know, if you, if you let somebody go and then, you're, and then you're afraid to show up in the grocery store at some community event because you may see them, that tells you a little something about how you treated them. We need to be adding value to people. People are valuable even if, even if the relationship, that assignment doesn't continue. Even more so, we don't know how long people are going to be in our lives. Some assignments are short, some assignments are long. We need to understand what God's purpose is for the time that they're with us and make sure we're investing in them. Not everybody is meant to, to go for the full journey. And I've had to let people go in the past. Maybe it's not a good fit. You know, they don't have the skill set for it. But it doesn't mean they have no value. There is another place that they will have the skill set for. There's a better fit for them. Maybe my role is helping them to find that. But the way I treat them with respect, valuing them, and adding value to them every day is what we're called to do. And that transforms people into seeing that God sees them, God notices them, and God is about reconciling them. So we have to understand the employer we serve, the primary employer, that purpose is what should drive our behavior. So it's all personal because it's all personal to him. People matter to him, not things. Amen? And bonus information on that point to build on it. I find that we're supposed to have the same attitude that Christ had. And Paul in the Philippian church in 2.12, he says, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard. Everyone see that? He tells us to work hard to show the results of our salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you and giving you the desire and power to do what pleases him. This next part, verse 14. Do everything without... <laughs> it, got, it got silent. You guys don't want to say that word. <laughs> let's, let's all read that. Do everything without... So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Let's stand up as we get ready to go to the Lord's Supper. And transitionally on that, I remember one time a new guy showed up <laughs> and sat down next to me, and he tried to bait me into complaining about the managers. And I just kind of looked up and I was like, yeah, no, we don't do that around here. And I kind of redirected him and said, you know, be careful to speak how to turn. It turns out he was the vice president of the whole operation. I didn't know him at that time. But we don't want to get into complaining and arguing. That doesn't represent Christ well. That's not a good attitude to have. We should be prayerful for others. We should have an attitude of a servant. We should be excellent in all that we do. And we should live a lifestyle that glorifies God. These are things that are kingdom habits that set us up to be the most influential in our place of influence. And you're going to be influencing people all day. You're going to walk out these doors and you're going to influence people in the parking lot. You're going to influence people waiting in line and driving down the street. When you get home, you're going to influence family. Are you exercising influence towards the kingdom or towards what you want? Father, I thank you for the bread in our hands. And in your brokenness, you made a way for us to be whole. And I thank you that you're restoring our bodies to health, our minds to wholeness, and our hearts to you. I thank you that at the cross, Jesus, you defined so many things for humans, but you established the purpose of God for mankind to redeem us back to yourself. And Lord, all through your word, you talk about so many things that direct us and guide us to imitating Christ and redeeming people back to the Father. So help us in our perspective. Help us to love people. Help us to serve you with joy and to gladness. And Lord, let us be excellent in all that we do and give you glory and praise.
In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, as we partake of the blood, we remember your sacrifice and all that it means for us and all that it's done for us. We thank you for the freedom that we receive, the healing that we receive, the restoration that we receive, the life that we receive from your blood. In light of today's topic, Lord, we thank you for the example, Father of Jesus, who showed us how to lead with purpose and to serve with humility. Help us to align our lives with your calling, to lead in ways that bring glory to you, and to serve others with the heart of a servant. Give us the strength to overcome challenges and the wisdom to know how to love and lead well as we partake in Jesus' name. morning church. <laughs> I am Diva and this is Calvin and that Diva with an E not an I. <laughs> what a lovely discussion and discipleship. I hope we all, we all learned something new today about making disciples. It's not just for the pastor or the pope or the missionaries. Um, we both would like to read a couple of ways of being disciple. Discipleship is not just about teaching, but caring, walking alongside others as you both follow Jesus. Asking questions helps you to see their heart and cause them to think deeply about their own walk with the Lord. <clears throat> when we ask questions, we cause people to search the word for themselves and deeply ponder what they think about the topic we are discussing. It also shows care for them and intentionally as you show interest in their thoughts, opinions, and lives. A major key to discipleship is getting into God's words together learn from one another, and share truth about God's character and goodness. And how you have seen this play out in your week. Talk about what you have learned in your own time and time with God and give them space to do so. Challenge one another through God's words. Work and allow God to guide you, time, your time together, whether you are discussing let it root, let whatever you're discussing, let it be rooted and grounded in the word of God. As you do all these things, remember that it is God who gives the growth. So we say, the Lord, Lord bless, bless thee, and thee and keep thee. thee. The Lord, Lord make his face to shine, shine upon thee. thee. The Lord, Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. thee and give thee peace, both now, now and, and forevermore. forevermore. Amen. The altar is now open for those who need prayer. WCF, you are equipped. Go and be church. church. <laughs>